I want to really thank Tom for putting this together. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And uh, it's amazing just not only to think about the concept of the North American flora for fungi, but also just to see all these people in the room right now. And you know, thinking about the possibilities of working together and making things happen, it's really exciting. Um, I was asked today to talk about uh, my experiences in Arizona. And um, basically, you know, the reason I got into this was just falling in love with the, the diversity of fungi, right? I mean, just incredible. So for me, it's been falling in love and, and then working with fungi. My day job actually was looking at uh, fungi that are related to biological soil crust. So this is what I was doing for my PhD, et cetera. And I was really involved in sequencing surveys. Um, so my work in Arizona documenting uh, Fungal diversity was basically uh, for love. There was no money, <laughs> and I didn't really have any time. So <laughs> um, I ran into a lot of things. But when, when people think about Arizona, this is what you think about, right? The Sonoran Desert. So in actuality, this is not really the case. Um, Arizona has a real wonderful diversity of habitats, OK? Um, these are broken out by biomes, OK? Um, so numerous biomes represented in Arizona, moving from the traditional Sonoran Desert that everyone thinks of, all the way up to Alpine Tundra. <laughs> okay, so just a real diversity of habitats. Okay, and um, I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with David Hawksworth's uh, kind of back of the envelope <laughs> estimation of fungi. So about one in every, for every single plant species, you have about six different fungal species as a very conservative sort of estimate. So we kind of did the same thing for Arizona. We know about 4,000 plant species there. Multiply that by six, and we're looking at the potential of about 24,000 uh, fungal species in Arizona alone. OK, so what my primary goal for this project was to really uh, get together a checklist for the macro fungi. And, um, Basically, so to help myself identify things. <laughs> so I uh, started out, and about f uh, four years later, I had gone into herbaria, I had gone into the literature, tried to gather all I could, and ended up publishing this uh, checklist in 2006. Okay? And in this checklist, we have about uh, uh, 1,200 macrofungal species. Okay, <laughs> so what we're actually covering in Arizona is quite low, and it's uh, more like this number here. Okay, <laughs> we're missing the mark for sure. Um, so these data were then uh, put into a website, so to make the data publicly available. So I had a checklist, uh, and lichens got thrown in, and slime molds. And, uh, but that was the first goal. Um, these data are now all on the MICO portal. So uh, we have the lists of variables there. So they're contributing to the more um, kind of general surveys that we have going across the country. Um, and I'm not talking about MICO portal today, <laughs> but I'd be happy to uh, sit down with any of you and talk about that for sure and walk you through that. Um, the second component of this was the Arizona MICOTA project. So again, this was just done on no time and no budget. Um, and basically, it was a website to tell a little bit about uh, fungal diversity. And then out there as a net, um, basically to ask people to, to contribute photographs or to contribute data or to contribute specimens. So it wasn't an organized uh, uh, bio blitz type of a situation. It was just asking people to contribute. And we met many wonderful, nice people. And what's really important, I think really critical here, is the fact that the so-called citizen <laughs> mycologist is such a valuable uh, component. And I want to use the example. We, uh, in southern Arizona, there was many people working for several years down in the Chiricahua Mountains, right? And it's a real treasure trove of fungal diversity down there. And um, some of the species were described, and uh, there's still many things that are undescribed. Um, and we had no data on this. It was never published. Um, by meeting one individual, the right person, 
he had all of the data for about five years. <laughs> okay, all of the things going back. Harry Tears had a checklist in there from 1991. Um, so he had checklists, he had data, and, uh, it, and also these really amazing photographs. So, I mean, the, the, the citizen contribution can be absolutely phenomenal. Okay. Um, and, and then when uh, Tom sent me an email kind of asking some questions, okay, one of the questions was, uh, did, sequence, did sequencing reveal unexpected changes in identification or unexpected diversity, right? And there's, there's no doubt in my mind <laughs> that there's a lot of cryptic diversity out there, right? Um, but I would like to turn this around a little bit and just ask the question, did examining specimens reveal previously undocumented fungal diversity, right? Because even at a real fundamental level, um, you know, the, the Arizona mycota is not known. <laughs> and that's just Arizona. And we have so much diversity in habitat there. This is just from some of my master's work. I was working on uh, gastroid fungi, what used to be called the Lycoperdaceae, right? Um, the uh, the name, species names that you see in gray were the ones that had been previously published. And that was, they were all throughout the literature, so I had to go and gather them. So 28 species um, just in this group, Lycoperdaceae, and only six of them had been previously documented. So that was an effort moving into the herbaria, looking at the specimens, and going out and making field collections too. So there's a lot of work ahead uh, that's related to getting out in the field, looking over herbaria. It's gonna be very nice that we have really well-documented records from different herbaria. People will be able to go online, look up and see what's available from different parts, which will be fantastic. Um, but there's a lot of road work you know, hitting the ground. Um, another example, um, I'm doing kind of on the side again, some work on telostoma, okay? And this is just a, a distribution map that we have made, compiled from a different herbaria record, okay? And if you look, I wanna point out um, right here, this is where uh, William Henry Long was working, right? You see all the species here, right? Look at Nevada, you know? There's two there, so is that real? Definitely not, so I think um, again, this is where um, motivating citizens and, and getting people involved, I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to cover uh, the breadth of uh, North America without really recruiting the public to help in that effort. So um, I think that's a really important part. Um, the second thing I'd like to kind of bring up is um, my new day job has been working with large-scale sequencing projects, right? Um, so. I would like to ask the question, what will our contribution also be as a, as a mycological society to the public database for sequences, okay? I wanna give you an example now. I've been involved in a, a project that's uh, sequencing soil fungi, right? And we now have the ability to generate millions of sequences, literally. And um, so here's a project where 45 sites and we generated about 5 million sequences that passed the quality control, et cetera. And we used a reference base sort of uh, assignments to recognize our OTUs, equivalent to species, or to put names on things, right? <laughs> okay, so as it turns out, Taking the database, the public data that we have right now, which is GenBank databases like Unite, we combine those all together, use those as a reference, and we're only able to recognize, on average, about 20%, 25% of the diversity that's there. And sometimes it's as low as 3%, <laughs> okay? And that's what we can recognize as OTUs. The second component of that is actually putting names on things, right? So, what we can typically name as, as well-documented species, if you take uh, GenBank for granted <laughs> that all the names are correct, which is another issue, but um, if you take that on its face value, all of, of these 25% that we can recognize, only maybe about 50% of the sequences we can then actually assign taxonomies to. So very, very low numbers. And again, that, the numbers get very low. So I think um, it's, 
it's going to be very valuable to, to make a contribution not only into recognizing specimens that are there, going back, compiling those data, involving the citizens, but secondarily, I think we have a real valuable contribution to make in terms of this is where a lot of this, the, our surveys are going, where people are doing massive sur sequence surveys. And so there, these, these types of surveys rely on well-documented fungal sequences that go along, again, with good data. Things like having specimens linked to that is an important com uh, component of that. Anyway, um, just uh, that's sort of the, what I had to say. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll move us along, and uh, we, can, uh, we can move forward. But thank you.